Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna be easier to record who's here than who's not here. <laughs> I don't know. It's you know what. When I was in college, it was uh, my school was I don't know about 40, 40 minutes, thirty minutes from Purdue in Indiana, and they had a big bar called the Neon Cactus, and Thursdays were Thirsty Thursdays, and it was a nickel. It was like a I don't know five five dollar cover or something like that, eight dollar cover. You had you had these thirty two ounce mugs that you had to buy, but you could bring them back, say, so, you know, you buy one and then you take it back every Thursday. Nickel 32 ounce beers. So some of those Thursdays, some of those Friday morning classes were rough. So I'm guessing you also partook Yeah, that was the, probably one of the few times that I've missed, missed classes. I know one time I, I, I actually went to class and I slept through it. And, it. and it wasn't like a big lecture hall, it was a small school. I think we only had maybe eight people in the class. So it's pretty obvious when your head's down on the, on the lab benches sleeping. It happens. Oh, I'm sure he knew. <laughs> nope. No, it's kind of take take the same approach that hey you know what if you sleep you sleep so why, why should I and I don't think I'm important enough to you know make sure that you listen right I think the worst thing is when the people start like dozing off they keep trying to stop themselves from from sleeping that's like you see the jerks and stuff that that's <laughs> could be dis could be distracting Yeah, snoring is. I don't. I don't think I've had anyone snore in, in any of my classes yet. But the class isn't done yet. I'll say that class was an eight o'clock class that I missed too. So, I mean, we closed down the bars. And I want to say Indiana bar laws. The last last call was closer to like two o'clock. I mean, moving to moving to Texas, the last calls were are a lot earlier, like an hour early. All right. All right. So again, this is very sparse. I do know there are people online watching. I guess the rainy, cool morning is keeping people down. Uh, hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, we've got, looks like nine viewers live. <laughs> That's on YouTube, plus our, what, 10? Not, yeah, 10, 10 in class. All right, well, you guys get to enjoy this one, adaptations to the environment. So as I said, we, we're dealing with like physiological side of things. Uh, I do think this thermal stress will be the last uh, presentation before the exam. Uh, I already kind of looked ahead. I think if we get to a spot today, I, that, that is going to be a good stopping point, and then we'll finish the rest of this presentation on Monday. 
Um, and then I think my plan on Wednesday then is to answer questions. So review your notes, come to class with questions that you might have over the notes uh, to, to review them, uh, including the Hardy Weinberg stuff. And we can, we can answer them if we need to go through a couple more Hardy Weinberg problems, we can. Um, so that's, that's kind of the plan. Friday, that exam, uh, you can come here and take it or you can take it online. Uh, the exam will be online. However, there may be an option to take it here. So paper version of it. Um, I talked to Dr. Strength. His class, his exam, you can't go back on the questions. So it's one question at a time. You can't backtrack. But if you come and take it on paper, then you get the entire paper test that you can, you can sit and take it at that time and, and get it done and over with. So you can skip a question and then go back to it. Um, I don't know how many other people are doing that, but it sounds like a pretty decent idea to deter cheating, to deter someone from opening up the exam and just scrolling through uh, and recording it and then sharing it. Uh, so that may be an, that may be an option. Uh, I'll know more next week. I'll let you know. All right, so adaptations. We have the law of tolerance states that organisms have a very clearly defined upper and lower limit in which they can survive. All right, and this is abiotic conditions. That's what we're dealing with. All right, and we made the introduction to say that uh, you've got these regulators or we have these conformers. All right, and that the regulators are going to have to regulate their internal conditions, and there's a range of those temperatures where they can do that. Outside of those conditions, it's that they're going to have a hard time maintaining their, their internal balance. Uh, sometimes these organisms, instead of trying to adapt, they just move. All right, they just move to to different areas. Uh, and popular one is migration. All right, that covers long distance movements. It covers harsh conditions over a large area. It covers harsh conditions over a long period of time. All right, but if it's just a, a short duration or a short or a small locality where that harsh condition is occurring, then it just kind of makes sense to move uh, short distances, go into a burrow, alter your activities, uh, like when you're active to avoid those harsh conditions. All right, so what we're gonna get to now is how do we adapt to the thermal environment? All right, we're gonna be a little bit more specific on these adaptations. We've already mentioned movement, so movement is always going to be an opportunity or, or an option for us. Uh, but these are mostly uh, adaptations, physiological adaptations. All right, so in order to start with this thermal environments, we have to recognize that we have two broad categories of responses when dealing with various temperatures. All right, first type is just to change your tolerance limits. All right, so you've got defined tolerance limits, just change them shift them so that we can now tolerate whatever range we are experiencing or we will be experiencing. When we change these tolerance limits, it's, we're understanding that our body is going to withstand a wide range of internal conditions. All right, so we're gonna let our body, internal body temperatures fluctuate. The second broad category is regulation, internal regulation. And this is homeostasis, that's what we're talking about. So now our body's going to maintain an internal temperature that's pretty constant. It's set limits. You know, when we talk about our own body temperature, it can vary. It varies in the morning. It varies in the evening. All right, not a, It doesn't vary by a whole lot, but it does vary. It does vary. So what this homeostasis is saying is we've got a range, and we're going to maintain that range, and then we're going to do our best to maintain that range across the, wide, the range of temperatures that we experience. And of course, certain temperatures, it's easier for us to regulate. Other temperatures, it's not. So that's what this graph is, is getting across, is that we have these external conditions that we're dealing with. All right, we're, we're dealing with those external conditions. If we're going to undergo homeostasis, our internal conditions are going to stay basically flat, near, within limits, within limits, we'll say. But if we're gonna change our tolerance limits and let our body handle this range, then we're gonna be a conformer. So our internal conditions 
usually go up as external conditions go up. Uh, going down, I don't, we don't see that. You don't, you're not going to see that. It's not going to get hotter and then you maintain cooler temperatures. Uh, that's, uh, but that line is there to kind of show that we would get changes. All right, so let's talk about these tolerance limits first. So these to tolerance limits, as we said in, in our last presentation, they're shaped by natural selection. All right, where we've been, where we've developed, uh, where we've evolved have helped to shape these tolerance limits, but our tolerance limits can, can shift. All right, so they can shift in their location or they can shift in how wide or narrow they are. We refer to these generically as a change in location or spread or a change of location and dispersion. It's a lot like what we talked about in that second week of lab where we talked about mean or averages, that's our location, and dispersion or spread, that was our variances and, and standard errors and so forth. So what I have here is that we have one species, all right, and we have two different populations of this species. And in those different populations, we can have different tolerance limits. So population A, the tolerance limits may be down here. For population B, the tolerance limits are up here. So if we take individuals from population B and move them to where population A occurs, they're going to likely die. They're in the intolerance zones. If we take population A and move them to, to B, they're going to probably die. All right. Now this is not this isn't two different species. Yeah, our, if we make comparisons between species, we're going to see differences or we can see differences in these tolerance limits. But even within a species, between populations, we can see these differences. And spread is the same thing. We can have a very narrow tolerance range or we can have a very wide tolerance range. Now, what do these represent? Like real life examples. So when might we see different location for two different populations? We'll say, again, we're talking about temperatures, so low temperatures down here, high temperatures up, up here. Give an example. Okay, species of rabbit, where? Where would our populations be found? Okay, so Arctic hare. So maybe we have an Arctic hare that's in the far north and then a little bit south. I think our textbook mentions uh, butterfly pop populations, moths. I think there's a northern population and a southern population. If you switch them, I mean, they, they can interbreed, bring them to the lab. They can mate, produce viable offspring, everything. They're the same species, but if you take them and, and expose them to the opposite's environment, they're not going to do, do so well. Their tolerance limits are shaped by the location in which they, they developed. All right. What about the spread? When would we get a narrowing or a widening of our tolerance limits? Okay. Yeah, so, you know, the answer was basically variability in the environment itself. So if we're in an environment that doesn't change, that's, that's basically near constant, then, yeah, we're going to probably have a narrow tolerance range. If we're in an environment that experiences variation and it fluctuates pretty, pretty, pretty widely, then we're going to probably have a wide tolerance range. Uh, example of this, uh, oftentimes we see this this narrow spread uh, in some ocean environments. So think, uh, let's say, coral reefs. All right, the water temperatures, they don't fluctuate very much. Salinity doesn't fluctuate very much. All right, they tend to have narrow tolerance ranges versus, let's say, something like this where uh, maybe we're up on uh, the rocky intertidal zones where you have you know, waves might break up and add water to localized pools. And then on calm days, those pools just sit there. They're not getting any new water. So they're in the sun heating up and you can get these wide ranges of temperatures from being warm to being the temperature of 
you know, the ocean out in those areas. So we would expect to see a wide tolerance range in, in those areas. We'll, we'll come back uh, to some of this, to this, this idea again. All right. So these tolerance limits, as I said, are shaped by natural selection. Really comes down to where have we evolved? Where is, have we developed? Where have, has our ancestors developed? All right. If we're in, uh, up in the north, we're going to probably have tolerance ranges that are, that are down towards the bottom in the cold. If we're raised in the south, we're going to probably have these higher to tolerance limits. Uh, but what about prior exposure? Could we do this at like the inv individual level? That is, could our tolerance be shaped by where we ourselves were raised? And I'm going to say, yeah, and that's why we have the second one. Our tolerance limits could be exposed by our prior experiences. And this has a name, it's called acclimation. All right, I think all of you have, have experienced acclimation before. All right, so acclimation is defined as an individual's physiological adjustment to challenging abiotic conditions. An individual's physiological adjustment to challenging abiotic conditions. How many of you have experienced this? Give me an example of when you acclimated. All right, so moving from snow areas down to Texas. Okay, how did you acclimate? I got a lot more attention to sleep. Like, I was dressed differently. Uh, my water was Okay, so you, you get accustomed to the heat, alter your, your, your dress, uh, all right? Anything else? I mean, that's a great example. Yeah, it's, you know, it goes both ways. So if you go up north, yeah, it's going to be brutal those first couple times. But then you, you tend to get used to it. What's that? Higher altitudes. Excellent. Higher altitudes. You know, why do marathon runners train up in Colorado? Higher altitudes. We alter our uh, red blood cell counts. All right, we're increasing our oxygen carrying capacity because those areas are low. Great example. Uh, I'm going to say the temperature thing. Yeah, going from north and continuous, continuously moving south, it was fine. I mean, yeah, when I head back north, uh, you know, when I lived in Tennessee or North Carolina, it, it wasn't, wasn't that bad. Now, here in Texas, man, I, I moved back, or we visited one time, and it was like low 70s up there. And I was actually chilled. And that's just kind of completely weird to, you know, as I think about it, because, hey, growing up, you're in the winter, and then it gets out to be like 60 degrees, and you want to wear shorts. <laughs> you, you wear shorts, you know. This weather, probably still wearing short sleeve shirts. Maybe a light jacket, but then I bet if I walked around campus, I'm going to see people with, like, big coats on, like hats, probably, like, gloves. It's, like, it's only like 50 degrees. That's acclimation. I will say, <laughs> yeah, Pennsylvania, Texas, huge temperature change. Ac yep. Oh, yeah. I've gotten used to it. So now when, when I have my in-laws, they still live in, in Ohio. When they come and visit, uh, they talk about how hot it is. And it's like, yeah, it's upper 90s, maybe low 100s. And you're in the shade and breeze. It's oh yeah, it's not that bad. It's comfortable. It's like you guys are crazy. It's like it's hot. Huh? Okay. Oh man. 
Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. I'm sure he'll get used to it eventually. Eventually. So uh, I'm going to give one more example, and it's usually the example that gets presented. Uh, I, I believe we talk about acclimation, or you, you've probably heard of acclimation in elementary school or grade school, and the example that they give is a watch. All right? So when you put it on, you notice it's there. You, you, you feel it. You fidget with it. And then over time, you just become acclimated to having the watch. The other, I think the thing that hits, hits home the most is when you put on a shirt and maybe it has a tag that bothers you, and it's like, man, I don't know if I could deal with it. And then really, like 10, 15 minutes, it's done. You forget it. You've, you've become acclimated to that, to that uh, stimulus, and then you stopped, stopped responding to it. That's all acclimation. All right, now if we're going to acclimate, or if a species or a population or an individual is going to acclimate, they're going to do so better when our environment changes slowly. All right, so we can't take an individual, you know, we can't take a Texan and relocate them to Barrows, Alaska, all right, and expect them to do well that first day. Okay. Yep. Visual, visual acclimation. So, you know, you see your nose. Yeah, you can, you see it and then you just kind of tend to ignore it. So if something's on your nose, like some of these masks, you know, it kind of draws your eye and you're like, man, this is bothering me. But eventually you kind of, you acclimate to it. You, you recognize it. Yep, so Yep, fish tanks, uh, pet fish are great examples of acclimation. Uh, so you can't just take fish, pull it out and switch tanks. Uh, some sp and I'm going to go back here. Some fish have a wide tolerance range and you can usually do that. Other fish have a very narrow tolerance range, and what we have to do is acclimate them to the new parameters, to the new tanks. Uh, quite, I mean, sometimes you have to do it slowly. And it's things like salinity, it's temperature, uh, it's dissolved oxygen is tied to, to that as well. Dissolved. Uh, so we have uh, naked gobies. They're more of a marine estuarine fish along the Gulf Coast all the way up the eastern seaboard. All right, they ha we have them here out in Lake Nasworthy. Probably been introduced when the red drum were stocked in the lake. Uh, and one of the former students years ago took some of those naked gobies and acclimated him to a freshwater or to a saltwater environment. So here they are, it's basically in, in freshwater. What he had to do is over time, over the period of I think a couple weeks, slowly increase the salinity while the fish is in there and the fish acclimated by altering its physiological conditions. And we'll talk about what that fish did when, when we talk about water balance because it's, it's tied to salts, all right? It's tied to the salt and, and those osmotic pressures, but they were able to adapt. And, it, and in order to adapt, they needed those slow changes, all right? It can't be fast. You know, usually if it's fast, the organism is just tolerating it until it can change. All right. So when is acclimation favored? It's going to be favored by species and populations living in variable environments. And I do that in populations just to emphasize that this isn't just going to be one species. You can have variation within the species as well. All right. So key point here, tolerance limits are not rigid. They can change. They can change. And it's not just changing over time. They can change. Individuals can change it by acclimating. All right, so once we, cut, once we understand those, those limits, let's talk about temperature. All right, temperature can have some major effects on our organisms. All right, ones that we're going to focus on are the, the effect of temperature on the biochemistry of the organism because that seems to be where we see the most effects. We can kind of ignore, you know, burns and stuff and, and, and freeze. 
uh, but the cold temperatures, hot temperatures, cool temperatures are going to cause a lot of changes in the biochemistry of a cell, of an organ, of tissues. All right, so the first effect is the reaction rates. So those of you that have had chemistry uh, recently or maybe in the past may have remembered the Q10s. All right, so Q10s describe the rate of a reaction, the change in the rate of the reaction for a 10 degree Celsius increase in temperature. All right. So the reaction rates. How do the reaction rates change? Well, usually when you increase temperature, you increase your rate of the reaction. How much of that increase is determined by our Q10s? All right, so then same thing. If we lower temperatures, we're going to lo lower the rate of the reaction. What does this have to do with biology? I mean, we can do calculate Q10s in chemistry. We're not doing that. That's, that's upstairs. Let them calculate Q10s. We want to know how does this affect our organism? Well, it affects our organism because of metabolism. Our metabolic processes is a complex web of reactions. And this is a very simple one. We, have, we start with A, we have a reaction that converts it to B, reaction that converts it to C, a reaction that converts it to D. And D is our end product. All right. If our temperatures drop too low, then it's possible that the reactions don't proceed fast enough. So then our body is basically starved for this end product D. We don't make enough of it. And if we don't make enough of it, then we're going to slowly die or the organism is going to slowly die. High temperatures can have a slightly different effect. Now with the high temperatures, we should be producing a lot of D because the rates are going fast. However, we might not because we have one of these intermediate arrows, one of these middle arrows are known, could be known as the rate limiting reaction. So that reaction can only proceed at a certain rate. So what ends up happening, we'll say it, it is that rate limiting reaction is right here. As our temperature increase, we're, we go from A to B and we start producing a lot of B, but the B to C transition can't keep up. Can't keep up to the increasing demand of D. All right, so while the reaction rates increase and, and we start to consume more and more, we can get to a point if we have a rate limiting reaction where, we're, we, where we can't produce enough of that D. We also have the possibility that maybe one of these intermediates is a toxic intermediate. Maybe at low levels we, can, we deal with it, we're, we tolerate it, but as it increases in level, now our body starts to react negatively and we could die. So that could also happen at a rate limiting reaction where B starts to build up because we're not breaking it down. We're not converting it to C. All right. So temperatures can have an effect on these reaction rates. And we, we gave some examples as to how the rates of the reactions could influence our organism, could ultimately kill them. Second effect of temperature is its effect on membrane permeability. All right. So now we're talking about uh, cell membranes, all right, tissue membranes. All right. If our permeability changes, then that changes the rates of diffusion and the rates of osmosis. All right. So we rely on osmosis to get water in and out of cells. We rely on diffusion to move some of our important molecules, some of our important, uh, important uh, cations. Uh, glucose, right? may need the use of transporters, right? but we're not actively pumping. We're not actively moving things across that membrane. All right. So again, if we increase it, maybe we alter permeability, make it looser so you know, things leak out of the cells faster. If we cool things down, maybe we make it harder for our essential uh, compounds to diffuse into the cell. The second aspect of this membrane permeability is that we could affect the membrane integrity. They kind of go hand in hand. 
All right, so if we increase our temperatures, we're going to increase the fluidity of that membrane. If we decrease, we decrease the fluidity of, of that membrane. And we see, we see some of the physiological responses uh, as it relates to membrane integrity. Organisms, uh, we talked about hibernation, and somebody mentioned those frogs that kind of freeze, can go rock solid. Yeah, some of their changes is they alter their membranes. They start to integrate more you know, unsaturated fats, more cholesterols into those membranes to try to keep it fluid at the lower temperatures and then also to kind of preserve, to preserve those membranes. So if there is a rupture, they can kind of fold back up for it, you know, fairly quickly. So membrane permeability is number two. That's how temperatures can affect it. And then number three, our high temperatures can denature proteins and DNA. Right. So you heat things up too high, you're going to break them down. Heat shock proteins are an adaptation to hot environments. Right. Thermophiles high temperature loving organisms. They've got these heat shock proteins. What are the heat shock proteins? They're just simply small proteins that help stabilize the three dimensional structure of the large proteins to maintain their function at these high temperatures. All right, you've seen it. Well, you've seen this denaturing in process, make eggs, all right? The egg white, it's clearish liquid, right? You heat it up and it turns white denatured it, changed its conformation, all right? It's not, when you cool it down, it doesn't go back to being clearish and it's not like, all right? It just does, doesn't do that. Heat shock proteins would help to, to protect against that. Maintains uh, enzyme function at these high temperatures. The, the opposite of those are these cold acclimation proteins. So you don't really have the same problem uh, of denaturing at the low temperatures, but you do have to worry about freezing. And you have to worry about ice crystals forming and then breaking the RNA and DNA in our cells. And this is where our cold acclimation proteins come into play, these caps, all right? What they do is kind of bind and protect the RNA and DNA to keep that from happening, all right? We've seen it, that we can see it in some other things, uh, in some other organisms, uh, viruses, where their, their genetic code is wrapped around proteins helps to, helps to maintain the integrity of that DNA and RNA complex. The which one? The, the, water bears. the, wa the tardigrades? The tardigrades, yeah. yeah. They're special. They're special. Uh, so, we don't know, have, know a huge amount on them. I tried to find them here. It, they're hard. I mean, they're tiny. They're tiny. I'll tell you, when I was in college, uh, the, uh, I think it was the invert biology class, the professor went out there, scraped some uh, lichen off of the tree, put it in water, and we found one. I mean, it was just dumb luck, I, I guess, but on the bark of a tree. A water bear? They are, you've seen them. Let me, let me open one up. Is that similar to TAC using PCR? TAC is uh, the actual polymerase. So it'll bind and then uh, rep, uh, bind and, and initiate replication. Tardigrade. Let's get a water bear. Gotta love Wikipedia. These are tardigrades. So that's a SEM image of a tardigrade. Um, when they move around, they kind of look like they're bears, minus the four legs. Um, let's see if they've got a live one. Yeah, I mean, tardigrades. I don't know what size that is. That contains eggs. It's a shed cuticle. 
Ooh, video. There's a living. Uh, I don't think we know enough about them. I don't know if we know enough about them. So they do dehydrate. They probably go undergo some sort of dye pause. And I know they also do that at, you know, like when they dry out. So I'm going to guess that they've freezing is, is somewhat similar. So just as a, like a comparison, we have entire books on like a single, you know, genus of organism. You, know, you grab a book on uh, Cenorhabditis elegans, the nematode that serves as a, as a model. I mean, they've got like an entire book and it's like 500 pages or more. Drosophila has, you know, a massive book. Uh, all we know about it. And like the book on tardigrades, it's like 50 pages. <laughs> See, it, it's tiny. Uh, and, and that's kind of interesting because when you look at it, you're dealing with, you know, it is, you know, ectisozoa. I mean, it, it sheds its cuticle, but it's, own, it's in its own phylum. And it's like, that's all we know about that one phylum? I mean, that's kind of strange. Kind of strange. But yeah, tardigrades are kind of like a, the ultimate. They can dry out. They can survive these hot temperatures. Now, surviving the hot temperatures, they probably uh, go also undergo this diapause. So they probably sense it, and then they just shut everything down so that they're protected. Do they do so with heat shock proteins? I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to look to see if we even know about those. Uh, so uh, cold acclimation proteins are going to help protect the DNA. The other thing that you can get is if you're going to live in these high environments, what we often see in these thermophiles uh, is that their DNA, their genome has more GC pairs than expected by chance. And why, do, why is that important? Why do they have more GC pairs? Because they're more stable. The question is, why are they more stable? What do you remember about A, T, C, and G? Some people are in cell biology. Didn't you cover that yet? Or genetics, I think. Genetics. Yeah? How many? Ooh, I heard three. Yep. Versus two. So that extra bond confers protection against denaturing. Uh, that's also if you're doing PCR. Yep. Oh, there it is. Yep. CG has three H bonds. It's why. Uh, you have to check before you do PCR. See, if, do you have a bunch of GCs in there? Uh, is it GC rich? And there are ways to kind of manage it. But thermophiles, which are you know high temperature loving organisms, they have that. Where do we find these thermophiles? Think you know heat vents. Think heat vents. Say what? Yep, tube effects. Yeah, deep sea tube effects, bacteria. Uh, I think that made the news. I think there's a news story on the hottest organ or the organism that lives in the hottest place on Earth. Probably every year we're going to see that now. All right. So in order to understand the adaptations, we have to understand how temperature affects our organisms. We did so with the biochemistry, but we also have to understand how does that temperature, how does the heat get to our organism, all right? So we're gonna talk about the, the transfer of heat, mechanisms of, of heat transfer, uh, and we're gonna recognize that our organisms are either going to gain heat or they're going to lose heat. And it's not they're always going to gain and they're always, or they're always going to lose. It's a continuous process. You're gonna gain heat from some sources, you're gonna lose heat from other sources, all right? So we've, I'm gonna go through this, these definitions. Uh, all right, so heat is simply the thermal energy that can be transferred from one body to another. That's your chemistry uh, definition, it is your physics definitions, all right? It's thermal energy, that is what heat is, and that's thermal energy can be transferred between organisms, between objects, I should say, between objects, all right? How it gets transferred is, are these other terms. So conduction here, HC is the transfer of heat between two bodies in contact. Transfer of heat 
between two bodies in contact. All right, so I can put my hand on, on the desk. I feel the desk is cool. All right, I feel the desk is cool. It's cooler than my hand because I can feel that, and that means that I am now conducting heat down to this desk. All right, I'm conducting heat to the desk. Conduction, transfer of heat between two bodies in contact. Convection, HCV, is a transfer of heat from an object to a moving fluid or gas. You walk outside, if you feel the air blowing on you and it feels cold on your face, you are transferring heat from your warm face to that cold air that is moving past. That is convection. That is our convective heat transfer. HR, that's our radiation. This is radiative heat transfer. This is transfer of heat between two bodies not in physical contact. Not in physical contact. So, I can't feel it here. I can't, I can't sense, just holding my hand away from the desk, I can't sense if it's, if it's hot or cold. All right? But if I go up to Kyle over here and get my hand close to his forehead, it's possible that I could feel the heat emanating from his forehead. All right? The heat that I feel all right, is a radiative heat transfer. He's transferring heat radiatively, radiatively from himself, the forehead, to my hand. Now, the ability to absorb or give off the radiation depends on a lot of characteristics. All right, but we have terms that describe the process. So emissivity, is the tendency of an object to emit radiation. Absorptivity is the tendency of an object to absorb radiation. All right, so you can kind of think about it as, you know, with the or absorptivity is color of shirts. All right, on a hot day, all right, sunny day out here in Texas, if you wear a dark colored shirt, you feel hotter than if you wore a lighter colored shirt. All right, the reason being is that that color altered the absorptivity of the shirt itself. The emissivity is a tendency of an object to emit radiation. So how well are we at actually shedding the radiation? Heat lamps, really good at emissivity. Really give off a lot of heat. All right. Other things, not so much. And then our last term is evaporative cooling, HE. All right. Evaporative cooling is a loss of heat via, via the vaporization of a fluid, usually water usually water. Doesn't have to be water. I mean, in, in the you know, real world examples, all right, uh, let's see what this stuff is. Virex, no, that's not it. Go into, I have a spray bottle with alcohol down in my lab. If you spray your hands on it and wipe your hands, your hands will feel cool. That's evaporative cooling. All right, that's evaporative cooling. The heat was absorbed by the alcohol that evaporated, all right, cooling down the surface, cooling down the surface. Now, evaporative cooling in organisms usually uses water, right? usually uses water. We sweat, all right, we sacrifice water to try to cool down. Now, this isn't just water loss that we have to deal with, but it also costs us energy. Why would it cost us energy? What's that? Push the water through the membrane. So push the water through the membrane. Do we push the water through the membrane? We'll talk about it. No, not really push, but we need to get the water across the membrane, right? We create a salt gradient. So what ends up happening is that we're pumping salts against their gradient. All right, so we're ex expending energy to do that in order to get the water to flow down its gradient. 
we'll get we'll talk about osmosis with, with the water balance and stuff so we'll talk more about it so with the costing energy yeah we have to get that water on that surface and it also costs of it could cost energy uh, if we're doing something like this what's that dog doing other than smiling he's painting yeah painting so just the process the rapid air movement was costing energy to flex the muscles and, and to get the air moving rapidly over that moist surface. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna stop here because uh, we're gonna go over this thermal balance equation and that's what we're going to be uh, talking about in terms of our adaptations. So you can look at this equation. What our organism wants to do is to make sure we stay in balance make sure that we have an H total in its tolerance range, all right? And if we start to get outside of its H total, then our organism is going to try to do things to get it back, all right? And it's going to do that by altering conductive heat transfer, convective heat transfer, radiative heat transfer, evaporative cooling, and so forth, all right? All right, so we're gonna call it quits here. We'll pick this up on Monday. Uh, this may go into Wednesday. We'll see, but it it wouldn't be it wouldn't be all of all of Wednesday. Wouldn't be all of Wednesday. All right, all right. You guys have a good good weekend. If you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to email. Don't forget about those quizzes. <laughs>